Hi, welcome again to our ongoing discussion on drama. Remember, in the last class, uh, you know, we covered a, a rather a wide ground, right? Beginning with uh, classical Greek drama, because that's the foundation of uh, Western drama as such. You know, we discussed how, you know, you find the origins of drama in the choral performances and then with the addition of one character by Thespis, it, uh, you know, and then Aeschylus, another character, and then Sophocles, another character, and then Euripides. And in the meanwhile, they reduce the number of, uh, you know, people in chorus, a lot of structural transformation that undergo. So we discussed all of them uh, in Greek drama. And of course, then we moved on to discuss, uh, you know, uh, Roman drama and from there English morality plays and uh, we discussed Elizabethan drama and uh, very of course uh, very briefly we discussed uh, you know drama in uh, 17th, 18th and 19th century of course not significant ones of course not in an introductory course please remember this is an introductory course so for an introductory course we have covered uh, a very you know, a uh, wide ground or even a, a, a very long stretch of drama as such. And as I've been highlighting, the intention is not to give you an exhaustive picture of anything. On the other hand, it is to, of course, you know, draw your attention towards these remarkable gems and of course, to pique your interest, you know, it's like you, if I can use this metaphor, just to tantalize you, you know, uh, with whatever is in store for you if you actually go to them, you know. So the intention is to drive you towards those playwrights, towards those genres, towards those, uh, you know, writers, not of course to, you know, exhaust it, okay. Yeah, with that, let's come to discuss modern drama in this class, okay. So when we say modern drama, uh, for the sake of convenience, we locate it uh, in uh, uh, the sense of time, you know, from in the 20th century, generally in the 20th century, drama in the 20th century, especially in the European context. Of course, next week we can take up a discussion of Indian drama in detail, uh, but now uh, modern drama. Uh, okay, so here is a, a kind of... Uh, broad timeline for 20th century drama. So whenever we discuss drama, so this timeline should definitely help you, you know. Uh, you have uh, the First World War, uh, it begins in 1914. Of course, uh, how is that important for modern drama? Of course, that's important for modern drama as much as it's important for, for modern poetry, modern fiction, because that plays a major role, because it changes uh, the very nature of humanity. The world war changes the very nature of humanity. It alters, uh, you know, societal perception towards, uh, you know, existence and other things. Therefore, it brings about uh, an epochal change, an epochal transition, uh, not just in the structures of society, but also in the structures of human consciousness. That's why these world wars play an important role, especially when we are discussing 20th century literature, okay? In 1928, uh, just uh, hardly, you know, less than two decades into that, we have Bertrand Brecht, an exemplary playwright, uh, you know, uh, beginning uh, his, uh, you know, he writes the Three Penny Opera. And of course, that inaugurates a new uh, school of drama uh, called Epic Theatre and all that, you know, Bertrand Brecht, therefore, 1928 plays an important role. From 1928, you have, uh, you know, again, 1939, beginning of the Second World War, that too is a very important one for reasons similar to the First World War, right? It brings about an epochal transitions in human society, human consciousness, and all that. Humanity's uh, outlook towards, you know, polity, administration, culture, existence, everything changes, okay? So it's a a greatest uh, geopolitical shift that takes place in uh, through these wars. Then in 1950, you have Eugene Ionesco, again, a very important uh, Romanian-based, uh, uh, Paris-settled uh, playwright. You know, he writes the bard soprano, which seems uh, to inaugurate another uh, new chapter in the history of drama. We are going to discuss that uh, in a very short while, but for time being, 
you can call it uh, inauguration of the theater of the absurd. And then to strengthen that in 1952, you have Samuel Beckett publishing Waiting for Godot, a remarkable play, you know. And in 1957, you have Harold Pinter publishing his birthday party. Of course, Harold Pinter is a, a Nobel laureate uh, too. And in 1961, you have Martin Eslin, a, a renowned journalist, a playwright, uh, and a sort of philosopher, uh, you know, almost uh, giving a namakarana for this particular uh, theater. He calls it officially Theater of the Absurd. The naming ceremony happens in the 1960s. The, see, the seeds were sown sometime in the 1950s and uh, the naming ceremony happens in the 19, in 1961 with Martin Eslin's, uh, you know, Theater of the Absurd. Uh, he uses the term for the first time there in a book of an eponymous title. Okay, so this is a broad outline that we can keep in mind while discussing 20th century drama. Now uh, we said Bertrand Brecht plays a major role because remember almost uh, until the modern drama until Bertrand Brecht. The sway and influence of uh, Greek drama on the entire continent of Europe was almost, uh, you know, it was very solid. In other words, until the 20th century, the influence of Greek drama was very tight. Therefore, even in during Shakespearean drama, of course, you find a lot of uh, unity, the unity of action that we talk of, unity of time and when it comes to you know uh, the characters protagonists being of noble birth and all that all of them they remain intact therefore uh, it has had a very strong influence until the beginning of the 20th century greek drama i mean the entire european drama is under the tight grips of uh, it's under the tight grips of you know greek drama as such okay so you find a fresh breeze when in Bertrand Breck and his experiments. For the first time, he says that the purpose of art is not exactly to mirror society because if it's just a reflection of society that we find in literature, why should we read literature at all? We can just watch society. Therefore, he believed that especially his theater, his drama, he believed that, uh, you know, more than reflecting, uh, the reality, what you need is a hammer with which you can shape reality, you know. So he considered literature, especially drama and theater as, you know, shaping agents, you know, uh, agents that bring in transformation into the structures of society, okay. And uh, he calls that uh, epic theater, you know, uh, a well-known German playwright and of course uh, his influence on European theater, especially in the, the 1920s or 30s is something significant, you know, epic theater. Now, his plays, you know, celebrate anarchic, nihilistic, anti-bourgeois sentiment. So, to a certain extent, you can find influence of, uh, you know, Marxism in his plays. But more than that, his plays display a, a, a grand disillusion with uh, uh, a grand narrative called humanity and its positive ending and all that. Remember, you know, we have already witnessed uh, the First World War and we have seen how the world has been, you know, uh, put in a great disarray and how nihilism has crept in, how the world has been thrown into the grips of anarchy and all that, right? So his plays explore all that both structurally and thematically, structurally and thematically. Therefore, you can say that uh, his, his aesthetic productions were shaped to a large extent by his political principles, his political ideologies, right? That's the reason why he said that his theater, his plays, his drama is meant not so much to reflect society, but to change society from within. That's why he, you know, uh, he begins using drama as an agent to bring about uh, structural transformations in society. The Three Penny Opera, Life of Galileo, very, very important work. In fact, uh, it's through that particular work that we come to know the trails, the travails of uh, Galileo and how an individual, again, an individual is pitted against society. Remember, Galileo, a major you know, philosopher and scientist 
who held a radically different opinion about uh, the nature of the universe, about the nature of the planet, about the nature of the solar system, about the entire cosmic existence, you know, and the, how that, uh, you know, radically upset the church and its doctrine. As a result of that, though truth was on his side, he had to undergo a lot of pain, trauma, and eventually even death, right? So, the travails, the struggles of an individual pitted against society is beautifully explored in Life of Galileo, right? You have Mother Courage and the Children. Uh, today, Bertrand Brecht's name is almost synonymous with uh, Mother Courage, a very uh, uh, well play. I mean, it's a one of the most, uh, you know, uh, performed plays, you can call it. And you also have an experimental play, the Caucasian Chalk Circle. These are some of his uh, well-known works, Bertrand Brecht, Epic Theatre, okay. And he introduces uh, a lot of uh, radical concepts. One is defamiliarization. We have uh, identified defamiliarization as a, te a technique of alienation, you know, wherein he believes that, you know, uh, the purpose of art should be to defamiliarize, not to make the audience familiarize with what is happening on the stage, but of course to bring them, you know, to bring a certain distance between, uh, uh, you know, art and society so that, you know, the audience can look at society from a fresh perspective. Once when you introduce the gap, that's why he did not encourage, you know, until his epic theater, Almost all theatres encouraged audience identifying themselves with uh, the actors and the characters that they were performing on stage, you know, empathy, oneness with the characters. So for the first time, Bertrand Brecht revolted against that kind of empathy. He said, I don't want the audience to be moved by the flow of emotions that are being performed on stage. I want them to distance themselves. They have to keep their logical apparatus intact in order to assess what is happening here. Therefore, whenever he felt that, you know, the audience is about to be moved by the pathos of the play, he introduced some funny element. Of course, later we can discuss this is a particular term he uses for that. Okay. So he wanted to create that kind of a distance between his audience and this. Okay. Defamiliarization. And then meta theater. Well, what is meta theater? Of course, we have discussed uh, this as a, a fictional technique, you know, breaking the fourth wall. You have, uh, you know, the genesis of the concept can be found in epic theater. Well, for the first time, he wants his audience not just to be passive seekers of what is being performed there, but an active interpreter. They, he wants his audience to be active interpreters, right? Therefore, uh, many times you find actors or characters performing on the stage directly addressing the wall uh, audience you know audience is called the fourth wall and uh, when you break that you know by when you make a character speak directly with the audience it's called breaking the fourth wall that's the concept of meta theater so he introduces that particular technique so that you know he wants the audience to retain the critical ability to analyze logically you know uh, and re, uh, and uh, rationally uh, uh, critique what is happening on stage. So this is uh, as part of that he introduces uh, alienation effect in meta theater and of course justice. That's the theater uh, technique. I said you know it's a uh, so what does he do? So he combines just justice is a, a beautiful uh, a portmanteau term you know in German. So it means uh, clubbing just the essence of it with gesture. So it's a kind of a, a performance technique. We discussed uh, several performance techniques, right, in one of the previous classes. Please recall that justice is one such uh, technique where uh, through a certain physical action on stage, the attitude of the character is revealed. You, usually uh, action on stage does not reveal the attitude of the character as much as plots and story. But here, this physical movement of the actor uh, can bring out the attitude of the character that he is performing, the role that he, is, he or she is performing, you know, they are performing. So justice. And historicization, that's again his uh, political belief and philosophical belief. What does he believe in? Usually, what does literature do? Literature says that, you know, I mean, it tends to universalize everything, human nature as a universal and unchanging component. 
but uh, Brecht believed that human nature is basically a product of uh, a particular historical situation. So, if the conditions, uh, uh, you know, the historical co conditions that produce reality change, then automatically human nature also changes. Right now, imagine what is the historical situation that we are talking of the First World War, and he saw firsthand the transformations in the structure of uh, consciousness, human consciousness, uh, you know, therefore he believed that human nature is uh, by and large determined by the contours of history, okay, that is uh, historicization. These are some remarkable contributions of uh, Brecht to uh, drama. From Brecht, let us go to theatre of cruelty, another significant uh, concept introduced in 1938. Of course, uh, the Thick shades of uh, World War, Second World War are already there, they are looming large, right? We discussed the uh, timeline. And uh, Antonin Artu, uh, in his book, The Theatre and Its Double, of course, it is its English translation, uh, introduced the concept Theatre of Cruelty for the first time. Of course, here radically transforms or redefines the very notion of theatre. Theatre is not. Uh, uh, you know, what is being performed, you know, not just a performative component like we understand theatre in its traditional sense. For him, theatre meant practice, you know, a practice where the purpose of this practice was to awaken human beings, human consciousness uh, and, you know, the way they feel, the way they react and all that. So, therefore, it is a, a theatre is a space of practice, you know, more than a space of uh, performance. Theatre offers a scope or a space for practice to bring in, you know, uh, uh, a changed consciousness, uh, consciousness raising activity, something like this, okay. And uh, by cruelty, because usually cruelty again has a very negative shade of meaning, right. For him, cruelty is not something like, you know, to cause pain or some kind of sadistic or masochistic element, no, nothing like that. On the other hand, he meant by cruelty a violent shaking up, you know, a physical determination to shatter a false reality or to thrust open the false hopes in which humanity seeks its shelter so that they awaken to the new reality. The physical, the violence refers to, you know, the force with which you make the audience get up, you make this audience sit up and understand the radical shifts that are happening in society. That is meant by theatre of uh, cruelty. Therefore, when somebody asked him uh, what is the purpose of R2, he said, I mean of this theatre of cruelty, R2 said that my theatre is meant to disturb the spectator, not to make them, you know, complacent, but to disturb them profoundly to such an extent that my performances or even my, you know, my plays should pierce the heart and soul in such a way as to free the unconscious repressions, the unconscious repressions that are there. You know, in when we say unconscious repressions, society will have played a major role, family, society and historical forces will have played a major role in the unconscious, I mean, repressions of an individual. So, therefore, he wants to unleash that, that is the purpose. So, in order to achieve that, he believed that more than dialogue, the spectacle was very, very important. Therefore, he exploits uh, using techniques of mimes, gestures and implicit meanings so as to create a very bright and vibrant visual spectacle. He tried to achieve the purpose. This is in a nutshell theatre of uh, cruelty for us, okay. Yeah, from here we go to theatre of the absurd. In fact, theatre of the absurd, it, it held its influence almost throughout Europe and even uh, into India until let us say the late 60s, you know, from 30s to 60s for about 3 to 4 decades approximately, uh, it had, it was like a, a, a kind of a, a cannibal variety of drama because in the, in the, in the glory of this particular type of drama, other types of drama almost, you know, uh, they, they vanished out of sight, something like that. Therefore, theatre of the absurd. 
uh, a canonical type of drama. What do you mean by absurd theater or theater of the absurd? Again, it's a phrase coined by Martin Eslin, a philosopher, a minor playwright, more than that, a journalist, okay? Martin Eslin coins this term uh, in, uh, you know, in order to describe uh, the plays written by uh, iconoclastic writers such as Samuel Beckett, Eugene Ionesco, Jean Janet, Harold Pinter, Tom Stoppard, and Edward Albee and others, he describes, I mean, he describes their plays as uh, 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 absurd theater. Uh, this absurd theater was hugely influenced by the philosophy of uh, Soren Kierkegaard and Sartre and other, uh, you know, even philosophy of, uh, you know, Heidegger, Nietzsche more than others, you know. Uh, existentialism played a role in shaping the broad contours of uh, absurd theater. Therefore, you find existentialism creating the silhouette of uh, uh, absurd theater, right? And remember, what is existential philosophy as such? In order to understand absurd theater, we need to know existential philosophy because uh, it's the philosophical tenet of existentialism that shapes uh, absurd theater. That's the reason why we need to know existential philosophy. Existential philosophy believes that, you know, uh, behind the creation of human beings, there is no apparent purpose now, in order to better understand this, now look at this. Behind the creation of a chair, an object, you know, there is a purpose, you know, when a carpenter creates a chair or when the first carpenter created the first prototype of chair, there must have been a clear purpose in their head, right? It is meant to sit. Therefore, a chair is created later. So many designs come, but ultimately behind the creation of a chair, there is a purpose. Behind the creation of a table too, there is a purpose. So there is a purpose behind, behind the creation of everything in this universe except the creation of human beings. Therefore, they believe that human beings have been thrown onto the stage and they don't know what their purpose is. That's why we feel an existential void, boredom and all that. So in order to overcome the tragedy, because so by birth it's like tragic. Human life by birth is tragic because we don't know what our purpose is existentially. Of course, when you say purpose, we are not talking in terms of a materialistic purpose. I want to become a doctor, engineer, uh, uh, you know, a scientist, not in that sense. What is the existential purpose? What is the philosophical purpose behind the creation of human beings here, right? What is the existential purpose? So therefore, in order to fend up, that's why they said that, you know, uh, uh, the entire human journey is, you know, from the journey from cradle to grave, you know, is a journey of a being from, from being to becoming. Our existential journey is a journey of from being to becoming something. So each of us has to find the purpose on our own. And that's a very uh, a futile task. At the end of the day, it becomes a futile task, right? And uh, Remember, we have had several world wars here that have almost destabilized the world order, that have destabilized the grand notion of, you know, you know, God, that have almost, you know, you find many philosophers, uh, great novelists declaring the death of God, death of God. Remember, because if God were to exist, would we have world wars? Would we have these kind of pandemics? What is the purpose? You know, what is, is there any purpose at all behind any of them? Or they just, you know, chance factors. So all of them are in the backdrop of that. Therefore, their plays explore it, theater of the absurd. So in the backdrop of the, this, we find the entire life, you know, futile, useless, purposeless. So that's why their plays explore it. You know, their, their dramatic productions explore it. We have already identified Martin Estler, I mean, Estlin as, uh, you know, the person to have given the nomenclature, the theater of the absurd. Of course, before this nomenclature was given in the 1960s, uh, already Beckett, uh, Ionesco, Adamov, Jeanne, uh, Albee were writing very well, you know, and their plays explored these concepts. Only the naming happened in the 60s, that's all, you know. And now there is, it's not a, you know, this group was a motley crowd. They were living in exile in Paris. So Paris provided all these radical writers 
a fertile home you know that's why you have uh, Beckett he was a French uh, uh, you know basically he hailed from Ireland settled in uh, you know France similarly you have Ionesco Eugene Ionesco from Romania settled in uh, you know uh, Paris you have Adamo from Russia settled in there so all of them you know uh, so it becomes a ground Paris provides all of them an extraordinary ground so they did not right in uh, conjunction with each other, their plays explore this absurd condition. That's why you club them together and uh, call them, you know, uh, uh, absurd playwrights. And uh, say for instance, uh, some of, uh, you know, uh, well-known uh, features of absurdism are, you know, they believe that the world lacks meaning, you know, the world lacks meaning and all that. That's why, uh, I mean, of course, we have discussed the uh, post-war uh, Europe, how it has to be reborn out of the ashes and things like that. And they also did not believe that, you know, language, they did not believe in the efficacy of language as an effective mode of communication, because if language were to be an effective mode of communication, then wouldn't we avoid great catastrophes that befell the entire planet, especially something like world war? So that means the very purpose of language as a mode of achieving communication between uh, two societies or two individuals, it's failed. Right. So against the backdrop of all that, uh, they begin writing this, you know, writing these kind of plays. And therefore, their plays, you know, the component of absurd theater as a, as a, as a result, you know, they float all the norms, all the norms of uh, traditional Greek drama, you know. So in the traditional Greek drama, let's say, for instance, you have, uh, you know, a beautiful beginning, uh, a, a rising a middle and a very convincing ending. So, in, if you pick up any absurd drama, the play begins in a very absurd way and in the middle of something. It begins in the middle of something. Say, for instance, Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot. It begins in the middle of, uh, you know, almost a godforsaken place. Waiting for Godot. Again, probably pun is intended on Godot. Okay. And uh, it begins on, on, on a stage when, when the play happens, you know, there are two characters sitting and they've been speaking randomly you know and of course uh, irrationally and uh, you know they're they're waiting by a roadside maybe there is just a tree they don't know why they're waiting all that they can vaguely recall is they're waiting for a, a person called Godo. they don't know anything about him they don't even know whether it's a person whether it's a man a woman or a thing or a god they don't know anything about it they don't know when this person would come and they don't know why they are actually waiting why they need to meet him but they're simply waiting now, doesn't it look absurd, right? Doesn't it look irrational? Something like this. It begins on the road conversation, something like this. And you have, uh, you know, uh, 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 there is another, uh, especially Eugene Ionesco's uh, play, of course, uh, uh, where it begins with two families talking randomly, incoherent things. There are, you know, when the play begins, you have, let's say, Smith's and you have Martin's. And they, are, they speak quite randomly. There is no, I mean, what this guy says, this guy reacts in some other way. And what this guy says, this guy reacts in a random way. I mean, you, may, you and I may not even be able to watch this play if we don't understand the conditions under which it was produced, right? It's incoherent, illogical. It flies in the face of reason. The entire play flies in the face of reason. I mean, reason. That's why when they were first produced, including Harold Pinter's birthday party, it did not even survive a theatrical perf performance of uh, you know beyond uh, six to eight shows. That means less than a week. It was only later, probably decades later, that Harold Pinter was considered a genius, and even later, uh, Nobel Committee also honored him with with the, with the greatest prize. But during its initial stage, all that it had was just one week performance. That's all. It was almost shunted out of the theater in which it was performed because audience could not identify what was happening here. So was the case with uh, Samuel Beckett's uh, Waiting for Godot, but comparatively it was better because gradually the audience began because there was so much of, uh, you know, in Harold Pinter, more than dialogue, pauses play a very, very important role, whereas in uh, uh, Samuel Beckett dialogues play an important role. Therefore, the saving grace in uh, Beckett was, uh, you know, the dialogues. Therefore, they began picking up flavor of absurdism through the dialogues. 
So, how do they float? You know, there are not, I mean, unconventional uh, narrative structures. So, it does not have, you know, in a conventional one, you have a, an introduction, rising action. Here, there is nothing like that. The play begins with two guys, uh, you know, interacting, talking, 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 and ends with that. And there is no meaning. It does not even, even the dialogue does not uh, lead them anywhere. In fact, it's even cyclical. It's not even linear, non-linear narrative, cyclical approach. As I said, when the play begins, it begins with uh, almost trams, two trams. Let's say, for instance, two trams and uh, discussing something about waiting for this guy. They don't know the reason. They don't know when this guy would come, but they're eternally waiting. And when the play ends, they're still waiting. And by the time the play ends, in fact, it's just probably two acts, you know, just two acts. And one of the characters even forgets, you know, who he is waiting for and why they have come here. And he has even forgotten how they have come here. You know, uh, a loss of communication, you know, a loss of, uh, you know, even any meaningful approach towards life. Because how do we construct life out of the ashes that the entire human society has been reduced because of the world wars? How do we construct meaning? The entire life has lost meaning, all right? That's why these uh, plays are born out of void. And how do they fill the void? By addressing the void in its entirety, in its entirety. So therefore, there is no clear-cut character. There is no clear-cut uh, you know, plot. There is no clear-cut uh, story. There is no clear-cut dialogue. That's why you find absurd drama, many critics calling absurd drama an anti-drama. It's not even drama at all because there is no dramatic. See, a drama is a drama because of certain dramatic elements, right? These elements constitute drama. So when, when those elements are missing, how can you call it drama? Therefore, it can be called an anti-drama, right? So something like this extraordinary exper experimentations. That's why if you are interested in this, please pick up, uh, you know, any play by Samuel Beckett, especially, you know, uh, uh, his play, uh, Waiting for Godot, or you have uh, Eugene Ionesco, you have Harold Pinter, Edward Albee, all of them are remarkable uh, playwrights. So this particular uh, drama held its way for almost uh, three to four decades. Though other forms of drama were uh, 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 performed here and there, of course, they did not gain uh, much prominence because uh, of uh, the kind of, uh, you know, the brightness that absurd drama exhibited from almost 1950s to, let's say, 70s. Or, you know, you find the seeds of that in 1940s until, let's say, late 60s or 70s, something like this. Okay. Again, uh, I hope you really enjoyed uh, this lecture as well. Uh, for a detailed understanding of this, you will have to go in. Please remember, these classes are not substitutes for you uh, to uh, reading them originally because nothing can, uh, you know, take away the beauty, elegance and the first-handed nature of, uh, you know, uh, knowledge accumulation and wisdom gathering uh, than going into the place. You need to go into the place and experience what they are saying. Again, time and again, at the cost of, uh, you know, uh, sounding, uh, you know, uh, repeating, at the cost of uh, repeating, let me uh, say this, that, you know, the purpose is definitely to help you uh, to move towards these original plays, to draw your attention towards uh, the extraordinary elegance and beauty of uh, all these writers, so that you can go there and explore whatever you like, okay? All right, so probably in the next class, uh, let's come and discuss uh, one of the uh, modern plays or one of the plays uh, so that we can see how, what all these components of drama that we have learned, how we can see here and all that, okay? Until then, uh, enjoy. We'll see you in the next class with a play, okay? Thank you.